Let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, chapter 2. As you're turning there, I want to give you a thumbnail of the rest of the summer. Next Sunday is the special fellowship Sunday, baptism, and the outreach blitz taking those bags out. No Sunday evening service because we're having the afternoon going out to pass out those bags. And by the way, you can pick them up and take them on your way home or on Monday if you don't get to it. But the idea is this week to get those out there. The next two weeks after next Sunday are going to be something I've been looking forward to for so long. I said to the elders, could I do a dialogue night through the Bible? And I kind of got all um, into this mode because just getting back from uh, the, the two weeks in Israel and the week in Rome teaching, most of it is, is interactive. People are saying, wait a minute, how did this and where did that and where does that fit? And when we're at the Dead Sea Scroll Cave, how do we know the Bible's true and how do you know which version's right? And that dialogue where you use the scripture to guide people through was Paul's chief teaching method for the church. He preached, but then he supplemented that with dialogue where you could ask questions. So they're preparing some kind of a big whiteboard because I talk best while I doodle. In fact, whenever I talk to people, I'm always taking notes and, and, and everything because I, as they talk, I write down the verses I think of when, when they're talking about whatever their question is or, or, and that's how I work on a whiteboard. So the next two Sunday nights, the 24th and 31st, will be those dialogue nights and, and it will be both write-in questions as well as whatever ones uh, uh, taken from the floor and we'll just have a good night. The whole evening service will be that after the music. Then after that, we're going to be going into finishing the, the tour of the Holy Land that I only got halfway through about four weeks ago. Plus, we're going to have the, the report, the on-the-ground report of what's going on uh, in Israel. Uh, we met wonderful with uh, Muslim evangelists, with missionaries over there. Uh, just, it's amazing what's happening prophetically, biblically, culturally, and, and as far as outreach of the gospel. Um, and then um, that will take us probably all the way through until the fall. So just for you to think about, it's going to be dialogue, Q&As, and then uh, Holy Land, and then, of course, we have special services like tonight's commissioning. So just for you to know, Revelation chapter 2. As you open there, we're looking at Ephesus, and we're examining just one thing this morning, and that is, now I want you to think about this, Jesus, the central message to the Ephesians is that they had intentionally left their first love. And there are two, two points to this. First love then and now. What is it? How do you leave it? And how do you get back? Because Jesus was very displeased with them. In fact, he threatens them. If they don't return to their first love, he was going to extinguish the light of that church in that city. And church history has borne out that they didn't, and he did. So this is a very sobering message Jesus gives in chapter 2, the first seven verses. This is a personal message from Christ. It's a part of his last words to his church. If you remember, Revelation 1, 2, and 3 are Christ's final words to the church. The church is not mentioned uh, on earth after chapter 3. In chapter 4, we see the church in heaven. Chapter 5, we see the church in heaven. All the way through the tribulation, we see the church in heaven. And we see the Jews, again, being the missionaries and the people of God on earth during the tribulation. Uh, 144,000 Jewish evangelists from the 12 different tribes, as well as the two witnesses, as well as God supplements all that with an angel in chapter 14 who preaches, kind of like a gospel blimp, preaches the gospel, flying through the air, circling the earth, kind of, um, a constant call to people to repent. So this is the final message Christ gave to his church. And he divides it up into seven pieces, seven individual messages, where he points out, listen, what it was that they had done wrong, what had messed them up from being the church that he wanted them to be. Seven churches, five of them had messed up, two of them had not. By the way, the two that had not, Smyrna and Philadelphia, Smyrna was suffering, Philadelphia was witnessing. Usually if people are suffering persecution for Christ, they're staying pretty straight. Usually the, the fakes and, and all the charlatans leave the church when persecution hits. And when you're witnessing, you're having to explain doctrine and testify of salvation, and that usually weeds out the fakes too, and the charlatans and all the, you know, just putting it on people. So, those two churches, the suffering and the witnessing church, Sardis or Smyrna and Philadelphia, 
See, I am getting blurry. I was much less blurry in first service. But um, those two, he has no admonition to. He doesn't warn them. He doesn't point out anything wrong with them. But the other five, he says, this is what you've messed up. These churches were real gatherings of people 2,000 years ago. If you think about it, just like we're today, they were meeting just like we do today. They were celebrating the ordinances of believer's baptism, of communion. They were having the proclaimed Word of God. In fact, the, the, the stars that you're going to see in a moment in the text that he's holding in his hand are the actual teaching elders of each church that were charged with, with faithfully presenting God's message from his Word. So those were real gatherings, but because he picked seven churches, in effect, the Lord, and remember I pointed this out many weeks ago, every letter ends with the same little admonition. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to thee, and it's churches, plural. What that means is all of these letters were to every church in the first century, targeting Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, you know, Philadelphia, and Thyatira, and Laodicea, but also going throughout all the ages to right up till today. But also... What the Lord was saying is, in every time period of the church, there would be people struggling with losing their first love, like Ephesus. There would be people suffering intense persecution for their faith, like Smyrna. There would be people that were so worldly that Gallup polling couldn't figure out that they're a Christian, like is happening in America today, that, that Christians have no difference between them and unsaved people. That's Pergamos. Thyatira, the same thing is true. They're, they're just going through motions. By the time we get to Sardis, they're dead. I mean, the church is big and has a high steeple and lots of programs, but no life, no power, no transformed lives, no moving of the Holy Spirit. They were just totally lethargic and dead. And then Philadelphia witnessing, and then Laodicea, rich, complacent, and useless to the Lord. This morning... Every believer back then was like one of these seven types of believers addressed by these seven letters. But even more than that, just back then, these letters are God's Word. The living and abiding sword of the Spirit. The living voice of God speaking from His Word. And so all Scripture, whether it's Leviticus and Deuteronomy and, and like uh, last Sunday... Oh, last Sunday, we had the best. While you guys were sitting here in comfortable air conditioning, we sat on the steps of Herod's palace in Jerusalem where the wise men came and stood and knocked on the door and went and shook up Herod. And, and we had our morning service there. And the next day, we had it at the Eastern Gate, and we read the book of Ezekiel. Can't think of anything more boring unless you're sitting at the Eastern Gate and see where it happened. But all Scripture, whether Ezekiel or Matthew or Romans, the Bible says is profitable. For doctrine, teaching us what's right. For reproof, where we're wrong. For correction, how to get right with God. And for instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. So the, these letters are letters written from God's Word to instruct all of us from the first century down through the ages to right now. And, and this is what we find in Ephesus. And this is the first point this morning. Believers in Ephesus had spiritual heart problems. They had a problem in their heart their hearts, which had been, at one point, finding Christ to be first and foremost. He was at the head of every list. He was at the head of every time schedule they made. He was at the head of all of their allocation of resources and their, their energy of their life. In fact, their minds. He, he always, he was kind of like a protrusion from their life. And, and everything they bumped in with Christ into everything in life, it was kind of like the, the cutter, the Coast Guard cutter that goes through the ice. It was what touched everything in life first was Christ. He was protos. He was foremost in their lives. But that had ended. They had left that. They had neglected that. They had ended that. And so they had spiritual heart problems. And the believers in Ephesus had declined from that first love that they had had for Jesus. Their hearts had experienced a gradual buildup of other things. It could have been all their ministries. If you look at and, and what we studied three weeks ago, they had ten big pluses. I mean, they were actively, they were in doctrine, they were in Bible study, and they were finding all the heretics. But they had lost loving Christ with all their hearts. And so there was an emptiness and a coldness there. And Christ's message for them and for us today is, love me most. 
And if you don't, come back to me now. See, Jesus says, I, I want a constant state in your life that you love me at the front end of your life. Not in the back when you find time, not on the side and the periphery when you kind of finally get around to it, but the cutting edge of your life. When you think about, wow, I've got 24 hours tomorrow, where is the Lord going to fit? He comes first as we calculate our day, our path, our plan, our Google mapping of our days. Christ is at the front. He's always the first stop, and he kind of colors the whole day. You know, I meet people all the time and say, oh, I don't have time to read the Bible in the morning. Besides that, I'm not a morning person. I'm a night person. Yeah, they're a morning person enough to get the toothbrush in their mouth and do this. They're a morning person enough if they have hair to comb it, you know. They're a morning person enough to get dressed. They're a morning person to check their mail and to update everybody and to do their job and everything else and to eat and whatever else they want to do. But they're not a morning person for the Lord. You know what that's saying? Literally, he's not at the front edge of every part of their life. You see, Christ said, I want to be in front of everything else that you do in your whole life. And if I'm not in front of everything you do, you need to repent. And you need to return to me being in front. See, that's the message of this epistle. Revelation 2, since you're there, let's listen to the Lord talk to us in verses 1 through 7. So let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. As you stand, follow along. I'm going to read... Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And when I say something that's not in the text, I'm going to say, would you look up from your Bibles for a minute? And I'll say something that's not in the text so you don't get confused what's in there and what's not. But here we go. Verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Now look up for a minute. Angel does not mean wings. It's the word messenger. And each church had a messenger. And it says in Ephesians 4, the messenger is the pastor teacher that God gives as a gift to that church. And that, the, the greatest treasure that a church can have is a teaching elder that teaches the Scripture. So to that person, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, write, these things, says he, who holds the seven stars in his hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So, so look up. Remember, we've already covered this. The seven stars are those messengers, those angels, the designated ones who represent God through his word to the church. The lampstands are the churches. And, and it's not lampstand like candles. It's lampstand like oil lamps. It's like thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Every church was to be like a little oil lamp that threw a circle of light in, in that area where they serve the Lord. And so that's why we're going to the mile. We're supposed to throw our light a lot. In fact, we've, we're a bigger light. And, and, and the Lord walks around Look at that, the lamp stands. He walks in the churches. That's his, his current um, ministry to us, walking among us. Look at verse 2. I know your works. And then he lists them. Your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they're apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Verse 3. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my namesake, and have not become weary. That's a pretty long list, and it continues in verse 6. But look at verse 4. Nevertheless, or you could say, in spite of all that, I have this against you. Did you know it's a serious thing to have God have something against us? To have our Redeemer, to have our our Savior, to have our intercessor, to have the one who ever lives to represent us before the throne. He says, Whoa, got something against you. That should just, that should shake us up and alarm us. Because what it is he has against, look what he says, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Not your first love's been taken away and cut out of your life. Look what it says in the text. You have left your first love. Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Christ considers it fallen Christian living when Christ isn't at the front. We've fallen. Fallen from what pleases him. Fallen from what he designed for our spiritual life. Remember 
from where you have fallen. Number two, repent. And then number three, do the first works. Or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. This is to every believer, every church, but every individual in the church. It isn't Calvary Bible Church supposed to have Christ at the front. It's every part, every member of Calvary Bible Church is to have Christ at the front. Then our church will. You don't, you don't design the building, you design the individual stones. Okay, verse 6. But this you have, here's another commendation, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Pretty strong language. Verse 7. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, plural notice, churches. That's to us today. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Which is another way of saying you go to heaven. Right? If you overcome, you get the tree of life, you're in the paradise, you go to heaven. So it's written to Christians. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for speaking to us. Thank you that every time we open this book, you speak. Thank you that your spirit illumines and, and brings to life your word so that it, it can be quick and powerful and transformational in our lives. And I pray this day that first love, then as we see it in the lives of these saints, and now we would look for it in our lives, will be our goal. And that no one will leave here today without seriously pondering whether you are foremost, whether you're at the front end of our time allocation, of our schedule, of our entertainment, of our plans, of all of our life. In the name of Jesus, we ask that. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, let me just pick up where we were. Uh, we, were we were actually on verse 4 when we ended last time. Verse 1 says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, point number one is, Jesus addresses them personally. This is not vague. This was an identifiable church. Why did he pick Ephesus? Why was Ephesus first? Well, there's several reasons. Ephesus was the second largest city in the empire. Um, Rome was one. Ephesus was number two. Ephesus was the first church that Christ dictated to because it was kind of like the de facto capital of the churches in Asia Minor. You would come to the port city uh, of Ephesus on the Keister River, and then you would go in a kind of following the meander. You ever heard of meander? Well, the meander river flowed through this region. It meandered around the other six. And so that's why. Thirdly, Paul had his longest ministry there. Paul served three years, Acts 19. Paul served there three years. And finally, Eusebius, who you probably don't know because he's been dead for 1,700 years, but Eusebius wrote the first church history. I was from Caesarea Maritima. And in the fourth century, which was a lot closer to the first century than we are, he said that at this time, Ephesus was swelling to 50,000 believers in the city of Ephesus. And remember, uh, Apollos was there, and then Paul was there, and then Timothy followed Paul and pastored, and the Apostle John was there. So we're talking about a galaxy of, of, of great teaching that they had. So for those reasons, Jesus addresses them personally. But look at the end of verse 1. It says, these things says, and then Jesus, in every one of these letters, gives kind of his calling card. He says, I'm the one who holds the seven stars, and I'm walking around the churches. And, and, and he identifies himself as in charge of the message and looking at the impact of the message on the members, on the, those who were associated with that. Now, in the first century, they didn't have church membership as we have it. You know, go to three classes and watch a video and, you know, stand up here and quote something. It was you associated with a body of believers, and they, they identified and saw Christ in your life, and you confessed him before the church in baptism, and then you shared communion with him, and you were always there, and if you weren't there, they knew where you were. And they'd go knock on your door and pull you out of bed and say, church has started, come on. You know, I mean, they were that tight. It was a community. It wasn't a drive-in, everyone not knowing anybody around them. It was very tight. And so Jesus said, I am in charge of the message that's coming to you, but I'm also looking at the impact of the message as I walk around. You know what Jesus, when he's standing by your pew right now, he's looking down at you and said, hmm, let's see. 
spent 37 and a half hours this week watching television, spent two and a half minutes reading my word, and you feel really cold and distant right now. See, that's, that's what it means. He's examining us. He's looking, and he's, he's speaking to our hearts through his word, saying, you've got to put me at the front. That's the only way. Jesus addresses them in verses 2 and 3 with approval. That's the third point. And you remember three weeks ago, there were ten specific commendations. No church gets so much commendation. Why did he commend them so much? Did you ever think about that? What, what made Ephesus the stellar church? Well, Acts 19 tells how they were brought into existence, but what they were is contained in the book of Ephesians. In fact, for just a minute, turn back to that little book of Ephesians, a real favorite. Ephesians, chapter 4. Uh, this is one of Paul's prison epistles. In fact, uh, Friday, we were standing actually in the praetorium where he wrote his prison epistles. And I told the folks, I says, you know, if you like Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, or Philemon, this is where they were written. While Paul was in, in imprisonment by the Romans for year after year, he's writing these precious epistles. But he wrote down in Ephesians chapter 4, and look at verse 22, he, he wrote down the three powerful habits. If you are living a victorious Christian life, if you're living a, a growing Christian life, if you're living a life that is pleasing to God, Paul says you have these three habits powerfully at work in your life. This is where we left off last time, and I want to underline them. Some of you, usually when I get to the end and start talking faster and faster, you kind of close your Bible. You know, I watch. And so I thought I'd repeat it so, so early, before you close your Bible. So look at verse 22. Uh, that's the first of the powerful habits. He says, put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. That's verse 22. Verse 3, be renewed. And verse 24, put on. So what he says is, I want you to begin to, to cultivate until they're a part of the very fabric of your life, until you do them without even thinking. You know, you can get to the point where you drive so much that you're not even conscious that you're looking at the road, but you are watching the road, you're, you're maneuvering, you're slowing down, you see the stoplights. It has become... Everything in your body is sensing, and you just have done it so long, you do it. It's the same with walking. We see so much out of our peripheral vision that a lot of people just walk along, and they can tell where they're going, and they can carry on a conversation. In fact, they're still on the phone, and they're texting and everything else, and they can do that. What he says is this has to become that much a part of your life, that, that you just are operating with this as your system. What are those three habits? Number one, start the habit, in verse 22, of grace prompted shedding. Uh, Paul says you, you have to begin putting off old habits. You see, there's this old movement called let go and let God. It doesn't say that in the Bible. The Bible says that when you and I are supernaturally transformed by justification, that God begins sanctification, and this is how God describes it, Philippians 2. Work out your own salvation. You've been justified. Work out your own salvation. What is that? Sanctification. What is sanctification? It's verse 22. Look down what it says. Paul says, put off concerning uh, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. What does that mean? It means that the old us, the, the flesh, that's the biblical term for the old us, our flesh, our flesh has to eat all the time. I'm not talking about your body. I'm not talking about your physical body. I'm talking about the old spiritual you. The one that, that, that lies and cheats and steals and gets hurt and gets angry and gets proud. It's not the, the new creation we are in Christ. It's our flesh that we live with. And you say, what is flesh? I don't know. Uh, even John MacArthur says it's an influence, it's a force, it's a power. It's, but our flesh is the enemy of God. And when we became a new creation, God put within us a brand new operating system, but it's still in the old it's kind of like uh, putting your brand new shiny apple into a dirty rag, you know, that you clean the floor with. And, and so now we have a little conflict here. That brand new apple, I'm talking about when you eat, is, is now getting dirty by the rag. And that's, that's what he's talking about. We're encased in flesh, the new creation we are in Christ. So what are we supposed to do? Well, he says, you're supposed to put off your former conduct. Our whole lives were driven by feeding our lust before we're saved. It says that, that we walk according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. And Satan is always prompting us to feed the flesh, to feed the old us. And so 
Our old us needs constant feeding, and it loves to be fed by television. It loves to be fed by, by all kinds of media that, that stimulates its fleshly desires, less flesh, less the eyes of pride of life. It loves to be fed by, by activities and by places that, that we used to go, and it wants us to go back there because it needs to be fed. And Paul says, no. You need to put that off. You need to be stripping that off of your life. In fact, in, in chapter 6 of Romans, he says you need to starve. In Colossians 3, he says you need to put to death. You need to spray Roundup. You ever do that? You know, you spray Roundup on things you want to kill, weeds in your garden, a herbicide? He said spray spiritual Roundup on the lust that, that your flesh wants to be fed by. So number one, Putting off old habits are like putting off old clothes. Old clothes are so comfortable, they fit us so well, that we often forget we even have them on. And that's why the Spirit of God, when we have daily time in His Word, when Jesus is at the front end of our life, every day He can interact with us and go, oh, by the way, did you know that the average American that you live around every day and go to school with and, and carpool with and work alongside and, and, and share a lawn with, did you know that every one of those average Americans around you spend 150 hours a month keeping up with everything going on in the world by watching television? And by watching it, they want to dress a certain way, they want to look a certain way, they want to do certain things, and they have this code language they all know because they all are watching the same thing, and they kind of have this community of the world. And he said they spend 150 hours doing that, and the Lord says, and by the way, um, you know, I've been sitting there waiting to talk to you every day, and you spend five hours sitting watching the television feeding your lusts, and you haven't spent any day feeding the new creation. That's why Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word. Literally, the, the saints at Ephesus got rid of the old way they used to live. They burned all that stuff. They got rid of their old media that enslaved them. Read Acts 19. They burned it. They said, we don't want anything to do with this. This is, this is luring us back to the old us, and we're going to strip this off. We're going to get rid of it. Continue reading. Look what he says. Secondly, they not only started the habit of grace-prompted shedding. Secondly, in verse 23, they started the, the habit of grace-prompted thinking, having renewed minds. Do you remember what it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2? It says that, that we are supposed to renew our minds. And finally, that comes through the Word. They, look at verse 24. They started this grace-prompted wearing. They put on Christ. How did they do that? Well, let me show you, and we're going to conclude with this. Look at Revelation 2, because I want to just define two words for you before we go. Revelation 2, look at verse 4. The first word is first love. That word is protos. Protos is a contracted superlative. It basically means foremost. It's from the Greek preposition that means before or in front of, and protos is a contracted form of that that makes that 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 before and front be in the superlative degree. So it's not just pro or pros, but protos, which means it's in front of everything else. In fact, the Greek dictionary puts it this way. It says it's foremost in time, foremost in place, foremost when you order things. You know, like if you put your money, $1 bills through $20 bills, you put them in order. It's, it's the, the, the most important one of any ordering you make. In front of other things, at the beginning of every list, and simply first of all. That's what foremost means, this contracted superlative. Now, how does that communicate to us? Well, it's the same word that's in Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye what? Protas, first, the kingdom of God. In front of everything else. That means Jesus says that the foremost time, when, when, when we don't have to sleep, and eat and do our job that we have to do, all the rest is discretionary. And in front of all the discretionary time is Christ. That, that's how practical it was, and that's how they lived. In place, whenever you put everything out, Christ is in the front of, of all of your piles. In the, in the list of things to do, you know how we all have to-do lists and everything else? We have this to-do list, and boy, I've got to do this and this and this and this and this tomorrow. And Jesus isn't even on the list. And the Word of God isn't even on the list. And prayer isn't even on the list. 
And memorizing a scripture and meditating on it isn't even on the list. In so many to-do lists. He said, I want to be on the first of all your lists. I want to be at the beginning. I want to be in front. I want to be foremost. I want to be first. And look what it says. If I'm not first, verse 5, remember from where I've fallen. Actually, where you have fallen, because Christ has stayed first and we have backed away. We have actively said, okay, you can be out there, but, oh, I've got other stuff to do. You, just, you cover the spiritual stuff. I'm going to go over here and do this. See, we leave. We've left our first love. He said, what do you do about that? Verse 5, repent. Remember what happened and repent and do the first works, the disciplines. You know what the disciplines are? Confessing and forsaking sin, praying and meditating, seeking the Lord, obeying Him, serving Him, nurturing our souls, Christian togetherness. Those are the works. They don't save us. They're the works of sanctifying grace. God's grace comes through the means of sanctification works. And that is by writing the word in our heart, memorizing it, reading it, having an accountability person with us, saying, you know what, I'm scared to death to witness. Why don't you? You know what, Mark Muehlendijk, he was on our Holy Land trip. You know what he brought with him? He brought enough Arabic Muslim tracks for us to all give one out. Wish he wouldn't have. I didn't want to get shot. I was on vacation, you know. But he reminded us, he says, you're over there for a purpose. Go find one to talk to. It was so interesting to see the Word of God going forth. Those are the means of grace. So, look back what Jesus says in verse 4. This I have against you. You've left your first love. I'm not foremost. So what do we do about it? As soon as we realize that's happened, we say, ah, you're no longer where you were. I repent. I've let the 150 hours of television or, you know, my trivial pursuits or whatever I'm doing... Take your place, Lord, and I repent of that. I have a change of mind. You're more important, and I'm going to have my behavior follow that. I'm going to change my behavior. I'm going to seek you first. This week, when you get the little online on the website copy, I list off for you the idols that the Bible says keep Christ from being first. And you can look them up. There's the idol of money in Job, the idol of career and technology in Habakkuk, the idol of our appetites and desires, we just never get enough of whatever we like, and the idol of distractions. That 150-hour television is one of those distractions. And the Lord says, keep yourself from idols. 1 John 5, 21. Let's all stand for a word of prayer. As you stand, I remind you of this, that after I get done praying, all the elders that are in this service will be here in the front. If you need to pray with someone, you want to talk about the baptism, you want to talk about the church doctrine, you have a spiritual need, the elders are always available at Calvary Bible Church. They always make themselves available. If you're new, if you're a visitor today, maybe this week or the last few weeks, uh, I would love to meet you. I try and meet, in fact, I just met a visitor and they said, I'm not a visitor, you dedicated my kid three years ago. And I looked up in my Bible and I found their name. I said, well, then I pray for you. But I just didn't know what face to put with that prayer. Um, you know, and so, but if I don't know you well enough to recognize you, we have our visitor reception. And it's straight across that hall. And we also, if you've never been, we have uh, lots of nice things for you uh, that, that we give out. And I hope that you will let us meet you over there. If you have a spiritual need, come and we'll pray with you. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the living and abiding word of God. We can hear you speak to our hearts. And you're saying, I'm not foremost anymore in your time and your schedule and your plans, and I want to be. And I pray we'd repent while you're speaking to us now, while we hear your voice, and say, Lord, I'm not going to let you get pushed to the back of the line and off the cart. You're going to be at the front, guarded, top of my list, foremost. That's what you want. Anything less, we have fallen, and we need to repent. And we do, by your grace, in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. You should go.